Welcome to Metacaucus video series, where we focus on high yield topics frequently tested in the NBME and USMLE exams. Today, we'll be delving into the complexities of gastrointestinal high yield topics, a significant and challenging condition that often appears in various forms on the USMLE Step 1 exam. Understanding these cases will significantly enhance your ability to tackle related questions on test day. Let's begin with a 45-year-old woman who presents with progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids, regurgitation of undigested food, and occasional chest pain. Notably, she has no history of heartburn or gastrointestinal bleeding. A barium esophagram reveals a dilated esophagus with a bird's beak appearance at the lower esophageal sphincter, and esophageal manometry shows increased LES pressure with incomplete relaxation and absence of peristalsis in the distal esophagus. These findings are typical of achalasia, a motility disorder characterized by the absence of peristalsis in the distal esophagus and impaired relaxation of a hypertensive LS. The underlying pathology involves the loss of inhibitory neurons in the myenteric or Auerbach plexus, leading to a deficiency in neurotransmitters like nitric oxide and vasoactive intestinal peptide. These neurotransmitters are essential for smooth muscle relaxation. Their loss results in unopposed excitatory activity, increased LES tone, and the inability to relax, producing the characteristic bird's beak appearance on imaging. In another case, a 45-year-old woman presents with progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids over the past few months, along with occasional chest pain and regurgitation of undigested food. A barium swallow study reveals a dilated esophagus with a bird's beak appearance at the gastroesophageal junction. Esophageal manometry shows increased lower esophageal sphincter pressure with incomplete relaxation and absent peristalsis in the esophageal body. This case again highlights achalasia, where the loss of inhibitory ganglion cells in the myenteric plexus leads to an imbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission. This imbalance causes increased esophageal tone and incomplete relaxation of the LES, impeding the passage of food into the stomach and resulting in the distinctive imaging findings. Next, let's consider a 36-year-old immigrant from Peru who presents with difficulty swallowing liquids and belching. His symptoms are somewhat alleviated by eating slowly and extending his neck. There are no significant symptoms like fever, weight loss, or chest pain. Physical examination and vital signs are normal, but a barium swallow reveals a dilated esophagus and manometry confirms absent peristalsis in the smooth muscle portion of the esophagus. This patient's symptoms are most likely due to Chagas disease caused by chronic infection with Trypanosoma cruzi. This condition leads to secondary achalasia where parasitosis-related inflammation and immune-mediated destruction of the enteric ganglia result in uncoordinated smooth muscle activity and incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Patients experience progressive dysphagia, difficulty belching, and an increased risk for esophageal cancer. Now let's discuss a 43-year-old man with retrosternal discomfort and dysphagia. Esophageal manometry reveals normal upper esophageal sphincter contraction, but decreased peristalsis in the mid-esophagus with increased tone and incomplete relaxation at the LES. These findings are characteristic of achalasia, a motility disorder caused by reduced numbers of inhibitory ganglion cells in the esophageal wall, leading to an imbalance that favors excitatory ganglion cells. The result is dysphagia, regurgitation, and retrosternal chest pain, often accompanied by a dilated esophagus with distal narrowing on a barium esophagram. Finally, consider a 45-year-old woman with a two-year history of progressive dysphagia, now affecting both solids and liquids. Despite using antacids, her symptoms persist. Upper endoscopy reveals a dilated esophagus with retained food, and manometry shows increased LS tone and incomplete relaxation, with absent peristalsis in the distal esophagus. This presentation is typical of achalasia, where immune-mediated destruction of inhibitory ganglion cells results in increased LES tone and impaired relaxation. 
botulinum toxin, which prevents acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular synapse, can be used therapeutically to induce LES relaxation and improve symptoms. In summary, achalasia is a condition that disrupts normal esophageal motility due to the loss of inhibitory neurons in the esophageal wall, leading to increased esophageal tone and impaired LS relaxation. This condition presents as dysphagia, regurgitation, and sometimes chest pain. Understanding the pathophysiology and clinical presentation of achalasia is crucial for the USMLE Step 1 exam, where this topic is frequently tested. Okay, let's move to another high yield topic, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, CDH, a condition with significant implications for neonatal respiratory distress. We begin with a case of a term newborn boy evaluated in the neonatal intensive care unit for respiratory distress. His APGAR scores were low and he presented with a barrel chest, scaphoid abdomen, and mild cyanosis. Examination revealed absent breath sounds on the left while the right lung was normal a chest x-ray showed multiple fluid-containing cystic areas on the left side with a mediastinal shift to the right. The key diagnostic finding here is consistent with CDH, a congenital malformation caused by the failure of the pleuroperitoneal folds to close during embryologic development. This failure leads to an abnormal communication between the thoracic and abdominal cavities, most commonly on the left posterolateral side, allowing abdominal organs such as the bowel, stomach, and spleen to herniate into the thoracic cavity. This herniation compresses the developing lung, resulting in pulmonary hypoplasia, a critical concern in newborns presenting with CDH. In this radiograph, we observe a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, a significant neonatal condition where a defect in the diaphragm allows abdominal organs to herniate into the thoracic cavity. The left image presents an unlabeled frontal chest x-ray of a neonate, showing an abnormal left hemothorax with no clear left diaphragm border, suggesting a potential diaphragmatic hernia. The right image, labeled for clarity, highlights several key findings. The cardiac silhouette is displaced to the right side, a result of the mediastinal shift caused by the herniated abdominal organs. A gastric feeding tube is visible, curving abnormally into the thoracic cavity, indicating that the stomach has herniated through the diaphragmatic defect. The border of the stomach is outlined within the thoracic cavity, confirming its abnormal position. The right hemidiaphragm is distinct and appears normal, while the left hemidiaphragm is indistinct, obscured by the herniated contents. This radiograph clearly demonstrates the anatomical distortions caused by CDH, particularly the displacement of the cardiac silhouette and the obscured left hemidiaphragm. Early diagnosis and surgical intervention are crucial in managing this life-threatening condition, which can cause severe respiratory distress in neonates. Understanding these radiographic signs is essential for clinicians and a key point of focus for medical examinations. In another case, a neonate delivered at 38 weeks gestation developed immediate respiratory distress post-delivery. Examination revealed cyanosis, tachypnea, and poor perfusion with asymmetric breath sounds and a scaphoid abdomen. The chest x-ray confirmed the presence of thoracic bowel loops with minimal lung markings and an indistinct hemidiaphragm on the affected side. This scenario further illustrates the severe pulmonary hypoplasia associated with CDH, where the underdeveloped lung tissue fails to support adequate respiration, leading to critical respiratory distress. Both cases underscore the importance of recognizing CDH early, particularly in neonates presenting with respiratory distress, asymmetric breath sounds, and characteristic imaging findings. CDH is often associated with significant morbidity due to the resultant pulmonary hypoplasia, and prompt diagnosis is crucial for effective management. In summary, congenital diaphragmatic hernia results from the failure of the pleuroperitoneal folds to close, leading to herniation of abdominal contents into the thoracic cavity and subsequent pulmonary hypoplasia. This condition presents shortly after birth with respiratory distress, absent breath sounds on the affected side, and specific radiographic findings such as thoracic bowel loops and mediastinal shift. Understanding the embryologic basis and clinical presentation of CDH is essential for timely intervention and is a key topic for the USMLE Step 1 exam. 
Okay, here we have another topic we explore in Metacaucus video series, where it's a high yield topic and frequently tested in the NBME and USMLE exams is Meckel's diverticulum, a common congenital anomaly of the gastrointestinal tract that is often emphasized in the USMLE step one exam. An 18 year old male presents with fatigue that has progressively worsened over several months. The patient has no significant medical history, but does smoke one pack of cigarettes daily. On examination, the patient exhibits conjunctival pallor and laboratory tests reveal a hemoglobin level of 8.5. Stool tests for occult blood return positive. Further diagnostic workup uncovers mild hemorrhaging within the ileum, just proximal to a five centimeter intestinal outpouching. The lesion is surgically resected and histological examination reveals ectopic gastric mucosa. This clinical presentation is classic for Meckel's diverticulum, a congenital anomaly resulting from incomplete obliteration of the vitelline duct. The presence of ectopic gastric mucosa within the diverticulum can lead to ulceration of the adjacent intestinal mucosa, resulting in painless lower gastrointestinal bleeding and anemia, as seen in this patient. For the USMLE Step 1, it's crucial to remember that Meckel's diverticulum often presents with painless rectal bleeding in young patients and is diagnosed using a Technetium 99M protectinate scan, which detects ectopic gastric mucosa. The NBME often tests on the rule of twos. Meckel's diverticulum is typically located within two feet of the ileocecal valve, is about two inches long, and commonly presents before the age of two. Next, consider a 30-year-old male who presents with severe abdominal pain and bilious vomiting. Imaging reveals bowel wall thickening within a blind pouch connected to the ileum by a fibrous band to the umbilicus. A laparotomy confirms the presence of a Meckel's diverticulum, a true diverticulum containing all three layers of the intestinal wall. The presence of ectopic gastric mucosa within this diverticulum can cause complications such as ulceration, inflammation, and obstruction, leading to symptoms like those observed in this patient. For the USMLE Step 1, it is important to note that Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum and that it can present with complications such as intussusception, volvulus, or perforation. Next, consider a 30-year-old male who presents with severe abdominal pain and bilious vomiting. Imaging reveals bowel wall thickening within a blind pouch connected to the ileum by a fibrous band to the umbilicus. A laparotomy confirms the presence of a Meckel's diverticulum, a true diverticulum containing all three layers of the intestinal wall. The presence of ectopic gastric mucosa within this diverticulum can cause complications such as ulceration, inflammation, and obstruction, leading to symptoms like those observed in this patient. For the USMLE Step 1, it is important to note that Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum and that it can present with complications such as intussusception, volvulus, or perforation. Let's examine a common clinical scenario frequently tested on the NBME exams where understanding the complications associated with congenital anomalies is crucial. Consider a two-year-old girl who presents with severe intermittent abdominal pain. Her parents describe episodes where she pulls her legs up to her chest and cries inconsolably. She also passes a bowel movement that appears mixed with blood. On physical examination, you find a tender abdomen with a palpable sausage-shaped mass in the right lower quadrant. Abdominal ultrasound reveals a target sign, which is highly indicative of intussusception. The underlying cause of this intussusception in this case is a Meckel diverticulum. This congenital anomaly results from the incomplete obliteration of the vitiline duct, leading to an outpouching of the small intestine. Meckel diverticulum is particularly notable for containing ectopic gastric or pancreatic tissue, which can cause ulceration, bleeding, and serve as a lead point for intussusception. This relationship is a key concept often emphasized in the USMLE Step 1 exam, where questions frequently test your understanding of how congenital anomalies can lead to severe gastrointestinal complications. Finally, we look at a four-year-old girl with painless rectal bleeding. TC protectinitate scintigraphy reveals focal radiotracer accumulation in the right lower quadrant, 
consistent with Meckel's diverticulum. This condition results from the failed obliteration of the vitiline duct and is frequently highlighted in the NBME exams due to its classic presentation and diagnostic approach. Understanding the embryological origin and the clinical presentation of Meckel's diverticulum is critical for answering related questions on your exam. In summary, Meckel's diverticulum is a key topic frequently tested in the USMLE Step 1. Remember to focus on the embryological origin, the presence of ectopic gastric mucosa, and the classic presentations such as painless rectal bleeding and potential complications like obstruction and inflammation. Mastering these concepts will prepare you to tackle related questions with confidence. Thank you for joining this episode of the Metacaucus video series. Stay tuned for more high-yield discussions on topics that frequently appear in your NBME and USMLE exams.